Yeah, you, you have to get there because some of those tea times, especially in the summer. Yeah, they may like have like 6 a, a 7.30 or 7.00 or I don't know, whatever time, but you've got to be ahead of them, you know, changing the cups. And Do they change the cups every day? Yeah, I, yeah, yeah, probably mostly every day, every other day. If you have a lot of play, you have to change it every day, you, or you should change it. Um, th that's probably more like the prestige courses, though. Yeah. What course did – were you working in Georgia or in Alabama when you were working golf course? Uh, I did both. I, I actually worked here at Old Overton for just uh, – just, I just did an internship there at summertime. Uh, then I worked at the Golf Club of Georgia and White Columns. It, they were owned by the same company, so I worked at both. Oh, there. got it. Yeah. Um, and so I worked at a couple other places too. So. This is such a big golf town. Yeah. I didn't really understand that when we moved down. <laughs> I spent almost five years since we moved down. And just all the courses everywhere, and there's so many, uh, there's so many kids that like play in high school. Mm -hmm. um, I guess, I mean, I'm assuming like UAB and Sanford have golf teams. You know, anything I'm about sure that? they do. I don't, you know, but there's junior leagues. I know, like one of our elders, his son plays. Maybe two of his sons play, but you're in some type of junior league, and you go around and play these nice courses. So anyway. That is pretty cool. But yeah. you were always in the, you were into more the agriculture part of it than you were the golf part of it. That's right. I was a I was a farmer. I've heard that golf car golf courses. There's my Irish roots coming out again. <clears throat> golf courses like take just statistically like an insane amount of water to keep to keep green. Yeah. So the greens, the the sand or the soil is typically sand. So it's it's like a beach. You know? Really? So, yeah. So it, um, you know, it drains really fast and. Therefore, you have to keep you have to keep watering it pretty heavily. Now, the rest of the course is not that way, but it um, you still water if you want it. If you want it green, you've got to water it. You know? So the fairway is sand with grass no, on top of it. Oh, okay. No, no, no. It's it's typically just normal. Oh, okay. It's clay soil. Yeah. I'm just trying to learn. Yeah. I'm trying to learn. You were preaching on barriers yesterday, and <laughs> uh, and like I'm, there's there's many barriers to to a good looking lawn. Is something that that I've discovered. You've been you've been talking about this online, yeah. but we should probably greet our our viewers. Hey, I'm Kirkwood. I'm here with Pastor Barry, <laughs> uh, Pastor Max on the road today. He's had a lot of stuff happen there on the road. They had a grandbaby, a new new grandbaby, uh, Coda Ruth Brunson. Coda. Coda. Does that imply this will be their last child? I don't know. You know, Coda means friend. Apparently, Courtney tells me. So. Oh, it does. Okay, so yeah. I, I'm thinking too musically because Coda is always yeah. what happens at the at the end <laughs> at the end of the uh, the piece. That's really cool though. What a beautiful baby! I saw the yeah saw the uh, the pictures she online. Really is. So Pastor will be back for this Sunday, but uh, he planned on for you to preach this week anyway, and and you preached out of Joshua. We'll get there in just a second. But the barriers to yard work. You and me were talking about this some. I think about the 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 uh, the curse in Genesis three so often. By the sweat oh. of your brow, thorns and thistles, the whole thing. Yeah. You've had because uh, you were saying how you like planted your yard last year, and oh, then you had yeah. to replant. What happened? So well, see, so we reseeded last end of May. So you have to wait till nighttime temperatures are a certain, you know, degree. And so we waited on that. We planted. We tilled up. Till the whole yard was tilled up. We evened it out, reseeded the whole thing. It started to grow in, but as the good grass grows, also the weeds also grow. And so you have to Sounds wait. Sounds like another parable. Yeah. And so it was like, you know, I was feeling really good about my yard. I was like, oh, it's really green. It's, you know, I'm having to mow it like once or twice a week. Oh, and wow. Th and then um, I sprayed out all the bad stuff, and it killed like half of my yard. Oh, no. <laughs> but the good stuff was still there. But So now the good stuff has to spread. But it just takes time, you know. We have to be patient about <clears throat> these things. There's so many lessons you can learn from doing something like that. Yeah. Um, my kids have been teaching me a lot of how to stop and smell the roses or just any kind of flower in general. Because it doesn't matter. You know this. It doesn't matter, like, whether it's a dandelion or whatever these wild flowers are. They're like, oh, my goodness, flowers. This is the best. And they'll go yeah. and pick it. They were at a friend's house the other day. Um and it, the yard was like covered with all these weeds. Mm -hmm. And my daughter was like, is it okay if we pick your flowers? And the guy was like, absolutely. <laughs> Please. Yeah. Just all of them. <laughs> if you don't mind. Feel yeah, free. could you get the roots as well while you're out there? <laughs> that stuff is really fun. 
Well, we should probably get to uh, get to the message here. You know me; I like to. I, pa- Pastor and I have joked because we've. I don't think we've gotten in the sermon until like the last um, five minutes or so in the past <laughs> past couple weeks, which um, you know he's not here, so I'll just blame it all on him. Um, I wanted to hear. I this was. I think yesterday was like the. Um, the second time that I heard you mention Joe Gibbs, just in, in mm. speaking, are you a big fan of his? Yeah, Coach Joe, I am. Um, I think he really loves the Lord. He, uh, I heard him speak in person a while back, and then oh, I've cool. got one of his books. So, uh, yeah, I think he's had a strong testimony for Christ. It, and part of his testimony back in you know when he was winning all these Super Bowls, I heard him tell the story of he got in on a business deal somewhere in Oklahoma. It was a like a residential. Uh, development by apartments or something, and it, it went south. And uh, he was in with a few other people, and I, the other guys filed for bankruptcy. And he said, "You know what? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to I'm going to pay this money back." Wow. And um, so he, while he was winning those Super Bowls, you would think, "Oh, he's making all this money." He really wasn't. I mean, the money was going to pay off this debt. So it just really impressed me that you know behind the scenes, here's a guy that really loved Christ and was really just being a man of integrity, you know, in his, in his finances. So anyway, yeah, I, I, I look up to him and have uh, enjoyed just learning from him. I'm glad to know that a little bit more about him. I, I didn't know that. I'll have to – do you remember what the title of the book is? The one you Yeah, read? it's called um, A Game Plan for Life. Game and, Plan for yeah, Life. Yeah, and he, he just it's, – it's on these different topics like finances or parenting, or, and he has all these different people writing on those topics. You mentioned him in the part of the message. I think it was during the application, mm-hmm. right, where you're talking about, mm-hmm. like, how not to consider ourselves as as self-important. You know, what was it? His wife wanted him to pick up his socks right after Yeah, his... they were in the playoffs, and he was reading the sports page about how good his team was and probably, like, how many points they're going to score. And he was just feeling so good about that time his wife said, hey, Joe, I need you to, I need you to put your socks away. And he just thought, the nerve of her. You know, like... <laughs> I, I can't believe she would ask someone so important, you know, to put away my laundry. And uh, but he's he said he had a practice of of praying on the way to work, and and the Lord convicted him, and so he called her and just said, hey, you know, you're what you're doing is more important than what I'm doing. Well, that was I can't remember exactly which point it was, but I thought that was a great example of the whole obedience over achievement. Yeah. Like in that moment, like here's something really simple. I just need to pick up my socks because it's something I need to do. Um, this achievement that I have over here, it isn't as important. Yeah. That's uh, that's what we saw in the life of Joshua, right? Um, we we saw we saw him prioritizing obedience to God. I, I mean, like. I don't know, even know if he had time to worry about <clears throat> achievement because the task seemed so insurmountable. Mm-hmm. Um, but you came at it, and I was, you, you told me ahead of time that you were going to challenge a little bit of like just some of what, uh, some of the whole um, Sunday school narrative that mm-hmm. we have with this text in mm-hmm. Joshua 5 and 6. We're speaking of the Battle, <laughs> battle of Jericho. Um, and you were right because I did not understand before. Um, and this is uh, of of particular interest to me uh, as a music guy. How the 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 walking around Jer- well, both the the time preceding coming to Jericho and then mm-hmm. the walking around Jericho was essentially a worship service. Could you unpack that for us again? Yeah, yeah. So you know, once they crossed into the Promised Land, Gilgal was there, and Jericho's two miles away. Well, they they recommitted themselves to the Lord. You know, through circumcision, through the uh, Passover, right. and and um, so those two elements. You think of all the decades that had been neglected. That was surprising to me. Yeah, you think of these these people had they had not seen their parents do those things, and so wow. Um, you know, imagine that. Imagine growing up and your parents never told you about the gospel. They never took you to church. They never. It just wasn't important. And then all of a sudden, you just you have a leader and you decide with your friends. You know, we're going to follow God. I'm going to follow Christ and. And that may be where some some of you are. You didn't have that godly example. You know, you think, well, my parents never took me. But you can decide, no, I'm going to follow Christ. And, um, of course, that's what Joshua would say, you know, at the end of the book. As for me and my house, I will, you know, we're going to serve the Lord. Anyway, um, so they recommitted themselves to the Lord, and part of that recommitment fleshed itself out at Jericho. So that was part of the worship experience. 
And it's all connected with the seven days in Passover, the seven days of walking, the priest, the ark, the trumpet. I mean, all that, it was, it was a worship service. It's interesting. Uh, it, even in the last, I would say, two or three years, a lot of, a lot of songwriters in the worship space are coming back to texts like this. The other one in... in um, is it is it Second Chronicles as well? You know, the battle mm-hmm. belongs to the Lord. Everyone keeps coming back to this: that the weapon of our, the primary weapon of our warfare against the enemy, mm-hmm. is worship. Mm-hmm. And it's just interesting that it seems like, um, you know, at least, well, at least in that worship music space, they're mm-hmm. rediscovering this truth mm-hmm. that um, worship is foremost in our in our following the Lord. Mm-hmm. Um, and in case the children of Israel didn't realize that, God says, no, 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 like you can put the spears and all this stuff aside. Like that's not as important as you just walking around where I tell you to walk and then shouting your praise to me mm-hmm. when I tell you to shout. Talk about the application of that for, for us today. Like mm-hmm. I, I, I'm just interested in, in seeing that fleshed out because that's always a tension of like, well, we pray for the Lord to move. Yeah. We pray for him to overcome barriers, and yet, like, there's there's a sense in which, like, our own action can be an answer to prayer mm-hmm. as well. So Yeah, so th- there is a healthy tension there. And Mark, Mark Batterson says it this way, pray as if it depends on God, work as if it depends on you. Oh, that's good. You know, so there, there is a good, there is a good battle. I am going to pray, but I also have responsibility. You know, in the next chapter, in Joshua 7, after the, after there are about 3,000 you know, troops go up to Ai and they think, oh, we've got this covered. And they're defeated because of, of Achan's sin. Remember, he had taken right, some right. of the devoted things. Well, um, Joshua gets on his face and the Lord just says, like, he says, get up. Like, what are you doing? You know, Israel is sin. So, in other words, you've got to go take care of this sin problem. So there is a time for action, but oh, but point. there is also the time for I'm going to worship. And so I would say just on a daily basis, I think what you know, whether it's evening, morning, afternoon, whatever that time is with the Lord, of just carving out that time and saying, Lord, this is your time, and just being all in, focused, praying, reading, meditating, and then when it's done, like, okay, God, like, I'm going to do my best now. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to focus and give my best to you and just trust that, that you're going to give me the strength. So I, I don't know, I'm learning that, and, and I see that here, and, and it's, it's in other texts as well. You know, I mentioned in the second service, the text in Exodus 14, where, um, you know, they're right there by the uh, the Red Sea, and the, the Egyptians are coming after them. And they're going, oh, no, like, <laughs> are there not enough graves in Egypt that, yeah. that you had to bring us out here in the wilderness? And uh, and then it's most of, Moses says, you know, fear not, you know, essentially stand there, and, and you only have to remain silent, mm-hmm. and God will fight for you. So if we will look to him, he will, he'll give us strength, and then we move forward in that strength. I think that is, that, that is part of our journey as Christians in the Christian life, is to, is to learn that sensitivity to the Spirit. Mm-hmm. Because it's, I mean, as we see in, in the Word of God, like it's never all the way this way, or it's never all the time just stand still. Mm-hmm. And it's never all the time work yourself to the bone. Mm-hmm. It's God's... God's uh, movement, God's God's own strategy in mm-hmm. a situation is it is situationally dependent, mm-hmm. but ultimately it's up to Him. Yeah, I, th- I think of Mark one. You know, we're we're saying Jesus got up early, went to a solitary yeah. place, but then he was he would spend the day ministering to people. You yes. know? So it is that both end. We, you know, if you have a job, you obviously have responsibilities there, but um, before and after, or maybe even during, that's when we're meditating on, with the Lord. You talked, um, you obviously gave a really good exposition of, you know, the battle. I use that in quotation, the battle mm-hmm. itself, because it was kind of a worship service that resulted in God just flattening mm-hmm. um, the walls of Jericho. Lots of great notes about that in the message. I'm going to let people listen to that. I wanted to skip to the part where um, after the walls have fallen and God's commandment to Joshua and the people to mm-hmm. devote the city completely to destruction. Yeah. Now, that's a really mm-hmm. tough one. Mm-hmm. Um, I, and, and, and I was really glad that you camped out there yesterday talking about the patience of the Lord, 
Um, you talked about that, that important proof text, you know, the, the iniquity of the Amalekites is not yet, mm -hmm. um, is it the Amorites or the Amal yeah, Amorites? Am the Amorites, mm -hmm. I apologize. Mm -hmm. The iniquity of the Amorites is not yet um, complete. Dig us back into that and maybe give us some more notes, because I think that's so important for us as Christians to understand. Yeah, it goes all the way back to Genesis 15. You know, when God is talking to Abram, he said, I'm going to give you this land as an inheritance. But, of course, Abram would never, I mean, he went through the promised land, but he would never receive it um, as, as his descendants would. So he says, I'm going to make you wait four generations, which is 400 years. Wow, yeah. And you think of all those hundreds of years in, in Egypt and slavery, and then God delivered them. But the whole reason, he said, because the, the time of the Amorites is not complete. And the Amorite, he's referring to all the ten tribes that lived in Canaan. And if you look, in, it's in Leviticus 18, 24 and 25. I believe it's 24 and 25. That's where he talks about what, what is the iniquity of the Amorites, what was sexual perversion and human sacrifice. Yes. Wow. And both of those are just abhorrent. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, we see that today, you know, often in our country. And yes. th those were the two that God said, because of that, I'm going to bring judgment on Canaan. And so, you know, as we said, you know, I had a professor at one time say, good theology is like a rubber band that you stretch out and there's tension. You've yes. got, you know, both sides. If you let one side go, it doesn't work anymore. And so that's the, it, it, that's the way it is with the Lord. We think, well, he's holy. He's just, as we sang yesterday, he's a righteous judge. I think, wasn't that part of, I think that was part of one of the songs we were singing. Yes, indeed. Um, and then on the other side, you know, 1 John 4, I think it's 16, God is love. You know, so he's both. And we can't let either side go. And so because he's holy, there, there, there's a judgment factor to that. And so, you know, we're in, we're in the time of God's patience right now. And, um, you know, count God's patience as salvation, as Peter says. And, but we don't, but that time could end today. It could end tomorrow. You know, we don't know. And so anyway, for, but part of Israel going into Canaan, that was God's judgment. Their time had ended, even though they had 400 years and, and seven days. I, I think, I, I just want to repeat that for people at home, because if, if that, that, is, that is one thing that's been mm -hmm. so helpful to me, this idea of healthy tensions mm -hmm. as we study the Bible, mm -hmm. because we're in an era where everything has to be so black and white. Your mm -hmm. mind has to be completely made up about this one thing, and once it's there, mm -hmm. once your mind's made up, that's your identity, yeah. and you can't be questioned, you can't have any... Well, the Bible stands in stark contrast to that, mm -hmm. because obviously our, our mind is made up about these core truths of the faith. Mm -hmm. However, um, God, in his infinite power and wisdom, um, he, he has the ability to hold these things in tension. Mm -hmm. Yes, God is infinitely just, and he has a righteous wrath for the sinful, and yet he's infinitely compassionate. You know, mm -hmm. we see that in his and his love expressed in Christ, um, uh, walking the earth, and then um, and then obviously dying on on behalf of the sinners. So, it's um, it, it's it it has to be a both end. I love that rubber band um, analogy. Yeah, I'm glad that we uh, dug back into that. Anything else there? Well, part of part of why this is such a struggle for us is we're we're children of the Enlightenment. So if you go back two or three hundred years, the Enlightenment elevated reason. It said, well, no, if something doesn't make sense, then you don't believe it. That, yeah, exactly. You know, where before it was faith, you know, just faith. And then so because, you know, for some of us, we may not understand that. We go, well, well God just, he couldn't be. He, he can't be a God of love because it doesn't make sense. Why would he judge? So we're, we're elevating our reason. Instead of submitting and saying, <clears throat> you know, I'm, I'm going to follow God as he's revealed himself. And he's chosen to reveal himself as, as both. And so we just have to submit to him and go, I may not understand all of it, but that's who he is, and I love him for who he is, and I'm just going to trust that he knows better than I do. Well, God himself says, my ways are not your ways, mm -hmm. neither are my thoughts your thoughts, saith the Lord your God. Mm -hmm. he, it, he projects that ahead of time, thinking about, and you guys are going to be tempted to elevate your own thoughts. I listened to a lecture on David Hume, um, famous, in, he's an Enlightenment era yes. philosopher, yes, mm -hmm. and he's... And his whole thing is like, well, um, if it sounds miraculous, it's not true. That's that boils right. him down. If it sounds miraculous, it's not true. Well, 
who who decides what sounds miraculous? And ultimately, mm-hmm. oh, it's David Hume who decides yeah, that. I'm so, the authority. Yeah. So who's God in that worldview, in that scenario? Well, right. you're making yourself that. That's right. Um, that's an important, um, that's another important, um, uh, I, I guess, I, I, just a thing to understand. Like, we're, we're, a pro, we're products of our environment. Yes, you know? very much so. The time, the time in which we live, mm-hmm. the, um, the sort of the Western mindset that mm-hmm. we grew up with. Um, and it's not just even to say all oh, that's bad, mm-hmm. but like to, um, it, we, 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 have to, we have to understand the Bible in its, in its context. Yeah, we, yeah, we should intention. be aware, uh, aware of our culture and aware of how we're impacted. And then how do we think Christianly in the midst of that? Well said. Well, I want to finish up our talk today the same way you finished up the, the message yesterday, which is talking about the barrier of faith. So we mm. talked all about different barriers in your life, but there's one barrier in particular, that is real, has the greatest eternal significance, mm-hmm. right? It's the barrier of whether you're going to have faith in Christ. I'd like to talk back through that again, especially mm-hmm. in, in terms of application for us right now. Because I, I mean, I encountered someone yesterday. We had a conversation, and it was, and it was a perfect example of this. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm not ready to believe yet. I don't have. The, I wish someone would give me the faith. I just don't have the faith yet. Um, Flesh that out a little bit more. I know that you were pressed for time there at the end. Yeah, well, for some people, I mean, ultimately we all have the barrier of sin that separates us from God. And for some people, you know, I had one guy tell me a while back, if I knew Christianity were 100% true, I would believe. So his, his, his barrier is doubt. I, I just wow. don't, I don't doubt, I don't think this is God's word. And because of that, I can't trust its message. So, the, so all of, there are a number of barriers that people have. Our main barrier is sin, but what's interesting with Rahab, you know, we see her actions, and we but her actions demonstrated her faith. So, of all the people that several thousand that died at Jericho, she and her family were spared because of her faith. And so, you know, for us today, when whenever Christ returns, those who have faith in Him will be spared. We'll be saved as well. So, um, you know, whatever your, your barrier is, I would encourage you talk to the Lord about it, submit it to him. Yeah. Say, Lord, I, you know, I'm struggling with whether I believe your word is true or I'm struggling with the problem of evil or suffering or wh- whatever it is, that's a barrier and just take it to him and say, Lord, would you help me with this? Would you help me understand? Would you put some, someone in my path that could help explain this to me? And I, I just believe, and I know that God, God will do that. And choose to worship him. Yeah. In spite of your doubts. Lord, I don't understand it all, but I choose to worship you now. This has been great. Great Amen. conversation. I'm glad to see you here yeah, today, brother. Thank you for leading us. Well, thank you for, uh, thank you for preaching yesterday. Um, pastor's going to be back in the pulpit this coming Sunday. We're going to return to our series, Aliens and Exiles. That's our series in, in uh, First Peter. So I know that's going to be great. Also, uh, and we even touched on it a little bit today, getting into philosophy. Pastor Barry is one is leading one of the three classes right now for a midweek university. So it's it's probably not too. Is it too late to join and jump in? No, if you want to join us anytime. In fact, we'll be talking about a little bit of church history Wednesday night and a little bit of the Enlightenment, and uh, then we'll get into we'll start developing the the different methods of apologetics. So, Great, it'll yeah. Be fun. Pol- apologetics. And then there's a couple other classes. You can check that out at valleydale.org. And if you want to watch any video or any other resources, you just need to get to our YouTube channel and uh, like and subscribe. I think that's everything. We love you guys, mm-hmm. and we'll see you later. Have a great week. Yeah, I watched. Uh, I watched Courtney's stream of your uh, of the class. I was so glad somebody streamed uh, it because I just wanted to listen in a little bit.